welcome back. Last time, remember, we talked about galaxies. Well, on Blackboard, there is a section under there called Examples of Galaxies. And I want to make sure that you have a chance to go ahead and open that, not now, go ahead and open it later on, and go through and I want you to identify what types of galaxies you think these are. Okay, and so there's a variety of galaxies out there and you basically have this portion of the PowerPoint on there. Just go through, tell me what kind of galaxies you think they are and we'll then go ahead, when we start in next time, go ahead and go through and see if you guys are right. So make sure you have a chance to do that before the next time. Okay, so now let's go ahead and start talking about the Milky Way. So I want you to imagine yourself standing out on a nice, beautiful, dark night. Nobody else is around. There's no lights, and you look up, and you see the Milky Way. Now, first of all, guys, you need to realize this is not a real picture. This is an artist's conception of what it would look like if we were standing right along then the axis of our Milky Way galaxy. So you would see it then rising right overhead. Now that's certainly a picture of the Milky Way. And remember guys, the Milky Way is the galaxy that we live, live in. And we are then a collection of billions of stars all rotating around a common center of mass. Now here's another picture of the Milky Way. And I don't know how well it's gonna show up here. And I will go ahead and provide the URL for this picture because I would like for you to go ahead and go look at it and kind of explore it. And when you look at it on the Astronomy Picture of the Day website, you can kind of get a full degree all the way around. But you can see that the Milky Way goes from one horizon to the other. And I will tell you that this is in the Southern Hemisphere. And I know that because I can see the large and small Magellanic Cloud. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you yet, but it will by the time we finish because the large and small Magellanic Clouds are galaxies, small, very small, irregular galaxies that accompany our galaxy. So we will have satellite galaxies and then we will have galaxies like the large and small Magellanic Cloud that are extremely close and are gravitationally bound to our galaxy. So let's talk about the Milky Way. As we stated yesterday, we are a barred spiral. We're an SBB. Okay, so that means, remember, that our spiral arms are not real tightly wound, but they're also not kind of flung out there. Okay, and we have a bar of stars within the core of our galaxy. So obviously, guys, remember, this is not us. You know, we're looking at another barred spiral looking down on it. That's what's really hard to take a picture of us when we're inside. Just another spiral galaxy seen edge on. Uh, I want you to pay attention to those spiral arms that you see represented because of all the gas and dust that's in them. And so that's what you see on that, what looks like a thin edge of the plate. And then you see the core, that nuclear bulge then. And then all the stars that you see in the picture are stars within our galaxy. So let's talk about the parts of the Milky Way. And there's a nuclear bulge. There's the halo, the spiral arms. And then you have the mass that's within the Milky Way. And that includes the stars, the planets, and other bodies, all that other stuff that we have out there. Then, of course, the interstellar gas and dust. And then this dark matter that we kind of talked about yesterday or the last session. Now, we're going to spend some time on the next, uh, one of the next two, talking about the Large Hadron Collider and come back to this idea of trying to determine what is dark matter and what is dark energy, as well as looking at the LHC to go ahead and try and, and look at some of the mysteries that we still have within our universe and what's going on. We're going to talk about the Big Bang, but what were conditions like down there at the beginning of the Big Bang? So guys, here's one of those pictures. We are here. You can see that we're about 100,000 light years across. You can see that kind of front full-on view, you see that little red circle about where we are. You see that core and then the spiral arms coming off of that. And then if you look at the picture on the right, that's kind of that side view. And so you see that disk of our galaxy, which is where the spiral arms are. <coughs> where the spiral arms are. And then you see <coughs> excuse me, the nuclear bulge, and then you see this halo. 
Well, this halo is where we're going to find then the galactic, <coughs> excuse me, the globular clusters that are going to be going above and below, and they're orbiting within the halo. Remember, guys, we talk about open or galactic clusters being within the spiral arms of our galaxy, and then these big globular clusters then are much larger <coughs> and will rotate and then go around the galaxy within the halo. Remember that for the most part, the globular clusters have really old stars. The galactic or open clusters have very young stars. And I showed you a real good example of a galactic or open cluster when I showed you um, the Pleiades. <coughs> this is a nice open star cluster. Then if I look at a little bit more in a different view, you can see some of the spiral arms are not wound quite as nicely as what this picture provides. But it still kind of gives you conceptually a feel for what's going on within our galaxy. And then you see over on the right side, you see where our, the sun is pointing right over there to right there. And then you see the halo of our galaxy. Here's a spiral arm seen edge on, and then there's that nuclear bolt. Remember, guys, that when we look at Sagittarius, when you look through Sagittarius, you're looking toward the center of our galaxy, which means you're looking toward this area right through here. Just another picture of now looking at how we are mapping then those spiral arms, because I find those spiral arms have lots of hydrogen and gas and dust, and so we can map them looking at the radiation that those chemicals give off because we can't really see all of them, but you certainly can then go ahead and map them looking at the radio waves that are given off. And you've got the URL to this particular picture because we're going to do some things with this on Blackboard. Kind of see the fact that you definitely have that bar of stars coming through there. And notice that some of those arms are named. You've got the Sagittarius arm and the Perseus arm, the Orion arm, things like that. This is kind of giving you that same type of picture, only laying out the individual arms themselves. You can see the sun's orbit, because we do orbit the galactic core. You know, just like the Earth orbits the sun, well, our sun orbits that galactic core. It takes about 240,000 years to go around once. And you can see that part of that is obscured simply because we can't see all the way into the galactic core and beyond. It's simply obscured by all the gas and dust that's out there. Then you can see the local spur that we lie on and then the spiral arms that are around us. Now, in terms of statistics of looking at, <coughs> excuse me, looking at our Milky Way, diameter, like I said, is right around 100,000 light years. The thickness is about 1,000 to 2,000 light years. So obviously, guys, it's much wider than it is thick. Um, we have between 100 and 400 billion stars. And guys, we are certainly not the largest galaxy out there. The oldest known star is about 13.2 billion years. So it's a little bit younger than the age of the universe. Notice that we're about 25,000 light years out, and like I said, it takes about 240, 250 million years to go around the galactic core once. So, guys, we have done that several times in, in our you know, time that we've been around. Now, when most people refer to the Milky Way, they tend to be talking about the spiral alarms. I mean, you go outside on this nice, gorgeous night, and, and you look up, and your eyes become dark adapted, and you see this incredible Milky Way. And so a lot of times they're really, when they refer to the Milky Way, they're talking about those spiral alarms. But the Milky Way is really our entire galaxy. And remember, when we are talking about the summer Milky Way and the winter Milky Way, we are looking at two different arms because we're looking basically in opposite directions. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to show you here. Here's the summer Milky Way, and you can see north, south, east, and west. See some of those constellations that we've talked about. You can see Pegasus down there and Andromeda, and, um, you know, others that you're very familiar with, or at least you should be very familiar with. And then if I look then at our winter Milky Way, Again, notice that it's going in the opposite direction. 
summer, winter. And you can see there, you know, again, some of the constellations. You see Orion down there. You can see Taurus. There's a Riga, Perseus. You know, so those constellations that we've talked about and you should be familiar with. Now, guys, I, depending on when you're taking this, please make sure that you are indeed going outside. But remember, take somebody you know, love, and trust, guys. And I want you out there by yourself. The other thing you want to do is take a flashlight and put red cellophane over it because when you first go out there, remember your eyes are going to not be dark adapted yet. So you want to go out just as it's getting dark. Go ahead and let the bright stars pop out. You can certainly find north because you can always find Polaris. And then from there, go ahead and star jump. And remember that I'm always wanting you to check skymaps.com and that will give you the map for whatever particular month we're talking about. Now, we kind of talked just a few minutes ago about how long it takes for the sun to orbit the galactic core. Now, like I said, that means we have certainly been around more than once, guys. And so if you look at the age of our galaxy compared to the age of our sun, it looks like we've made between 20 and 25 trips around the Milky Way. So for us, if you think about what a year is, a galactic year, we're actually only 20 to 25 years old. We're just a young pup here. Remember, guys, we assumed that the sun formed about 5 billion years ago. Now, we do have two satellite galaxies. The satellite galaxies are galaxies that are going around the common center of mass within our galaxy. And so they're kind of attached to us. And a lot of times, they are dwarf elliptical galaxies. And so we've got Sagittarius, which was discovered in 1994. Notice, guys, 1994. Uh, you know, it's a very small, and it was really hard to spot. But it was discovered in 1994. It's traveling in a polar orbit. And it's about 50,000 light years away from the core, so that means it's further out than what we are. And it contains very old stars. And then you have the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy. Notice it wasn't discovered until 2003, even smaller. Uh, it's about 25,000 light years away from the sun, so it's about the same distance that we are. And it contains a really high percentage of red giant stars. And one thing we do know about it, because of where it is and where it's located and what's going on, we know that it's in the process of being ripped apart by the Milky Way. That's because it's simply being pulled apart because of the gravitational attraction of the Milky Way. And so it's probably not going to survive very long. Uh, both galaxies, like I said, contain about a billion stars. You know, now a billion stars sounds like a really large number of stars, guys. But, you know, we contain between 100 and 400 billion stars. So these are very small galaxies. And like I said, unfortunately, they're in the process of being consumed by the Milky Way. And when I say consumed, they're close enough that that gravitational attraction is pulling them in. And not only is it pulling them in, it's also kind of pulling them apart. You can see that that's really, really hard to see. And that's why this thing was so hard to find. And this happens to be the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. And if you get up to the screen really close, you can see there's a bunch of stars in there. And I'm sorry, this isn't a regular galaxy, not a dwarf elliptical. I apologize. And that's what I mean when it's kind of being pulled apart. You can see the Milky Way in there. You can see the sun. You can see that kind of pink area in there is a Canis Major Galaxy. And then you see these streams of the Canis Major Galaxy because, again, it's simply being pulled apart by the Milky Way itself. The Milky Way is so much larger than what it is that as it moves around there, gravity is pulling on it and pulling it apart. Then we have really close neighbors, and that's what we talk about, the large and small Magellanic Clouds. And as remember that picture that I showed you at the beginning and the one that you had the URL to on... Uh, astronomy picture of the day. Those things have been around for a really long time. Magellanic, they were named for, again, Straits of Magellan, you know, when he was down there exploring. So they have been known for a long time because all you have to do is look up and see them. You do not need a telescope to see the large and small Magellanic clouds. They're about 180,000 light years away, which means they're relatively close. Um, you can see that they're regular galaxies, and when you look at them, 
better pictures, guys, you're going to find out that, yeah, they just do not look like normal galaxies. They, they don't have that shape. They don't have those nice spiral arms. They're not even elliptical shape. You know, they're just really irregular galaxies. And they're about, between the two of them, they're about 75,000 light years apart. Uh, you can, like I said, see them. All you have to do is look up and you're, you're in the southern hemisphere. They are certainly on my bucket list before I die. I want to see those things with my naked eyes. So in other words, I want to be able to be down in the southern hemisphere and just look up and be able to see them. Now, notice, guys, that they are traveling by. They're not going around the Milky Way. But because they are traveling by the Milky Way, that means that there is still that gravitational attraction between the Milky Way and the large and the small Magellanic clouds. And again, of the three objects, the Milky Way is much, much, much larger. And so that tends to be pulling apart then both the large and small Magellanic clouds. So they are very distorted by the Milky Way's gravitational forces in there. And there also seems to be streams of neutral hydrogen that connects them to us, which is another indication that, yes, there is a very large gravitational attraction out there. And so you're seeing that hydrogen basically back and forth between the um, Magellanic clouds and us. See, when you look at them, they're just, you know, not really nice spirals. They're not really nice ellipticals. They're just nice irregular galaxies out there. But one of the things that is cool about them is they are close enough that we can see novas and supernovas in them, things like that. And so when we observe those stars then in the large and small Magellanic clouds, then we're looking at those evolutionary sequences and what goes on there probably goes on here. This one happens to be the small Magellanic cloud, the other one is the large Magellanic cloud. And then in this shot too, you have then to the center and the left, you have a really nice globular cluster. And remember guys, those globular clusters are orbiting within the halo of our galaxy. Maybe kind of a neat shot there with a the small Magellanic cloud and then that really nice little globular cluster, which again, we have to be down in the southern hemisphere to be able to see. Now, I want to kind of show you this website to start with, and then I'm going to have you guys actually go through and look at it. But this is a, what's called the Atlas of the Universe, and it's kind of giving you an idea of what our universe looks like. But more importantly, if we look at something that's 250 light years from the sun, that's 5,000 light years from the sun, that's 50,000, and it goes all the way down to what's going on within the edge of our universe. And so, You'll have the URL on Blackboard, and I would like for you to kind of explore it to kind of see what our universe is like. And when we talk about our local group and when we talk about stars within our galaxy, what do we really mean and what are the distances associated with that? So the Atlas of the Universe is what I would like for you to go ahead and look at. And the URL is there. It will also be on Blackboard. Because that's really our neighborhood. We find out that we don't really live alone here. We have our galaxy, and then we have everything else around us that's very close to us, those satellite galaxies, the large and small Magellanic clouds that are going by us, as well as then our local group of galaxies. Now, we're going to come back to our local group a little bit later, but I at least wanted to introduce it here. So now let's go back and look at how we are making and distinguishing what's going on with these galaxies. And so in 1845, you know, telescopes are getting to the point that they're getting larger and larger and larger. They're able to then go ahead and have a greater light gathering power. And so we're able to see further and further into space. And so um, Lord Rossi then in 1845 was able to go ahead and build a telescope that was finally able to distinguish between spirals and elliptical galaxies. Now, notice that I have the word nebulous first because that's basically what he was looking at. He didn't have any clue until, you know, we talked about that great debate last time and what that island universe was when we were talking about Andromeda. Right now, these things are still being thought to be within our galaxy itself. And so with that telescope, he was finally able to make out individual points of light within those nebulas. Well, what he was really doing was in looking at individual stars within those galaxies. Now, granted, guys, these galaxies had to be relatively close to us. If you start looking at really far galaxies, there's no way you're ever going to be able to see individual stars. 
Now, you've certainly seen this picture before in terms of looking at those really nice areas that are undergoing stellar formation. Any place you have that pink, that also kind of delineates exactly where those spiral arms are. But starting to look at the fact that these nebulas, these gas and dust clouds, seem to have a structure to them. They seem to really belong in our galaxy because they do have their own structure and they look a lot like, again, galaxies which you know, are something that stand alone and not something that within our own galaxy. Just happen to be looking through our galaxy at these others. Then William Herschel was the for, first one that made something in terms of looking at the Milky Way structure and shape. And so he was out there and he started plotting the number of stars. And so this is really the first important discovery about the Milky Way structure and shape that we've got. And like I said, he literally counted stars. He found that most of the stars lie in the Milky Way arms, okay? But that number seemed to be the same in about any direction. Now, think about it, guys. If that number is the same in any direction, that tends to put us then at the center. Yeah, obviously he was wrong there. But, you know, in terms of trying to determine what's going on, yes, there's certainly going to be changes, but you've got to start someplace. And so he kind of put us at the center of the galaxy because everything seemed to be the same all the way around. And there was way too much of gas and dust that he didn't know about, which is why he didn't quite get the fact that there's a whole other part of the galaxy that he didn't see. And so this is just another picture of the Milky Way. And guys, I've got the URLs for these pictures because unfortunately they don't show up real well on here. But I at least wanted you to see them here and then I will send you to the URLs. And so you've got this nice Milky Way across there. And I want you to think that you're standing there and you're starting to count all these stars and you find that the stars decrease in number going above and below the Milky Way. But notice, it looks like we're in the middle of it. I mean, everything seems to go around us, just like when we first started looking at where our place was within the solar system, everything seemed to be centered around us. Well, same thing here. As we know, that's not really true, it's just from your perspective. Really nice long exposure of the Milky Way here. But as you look up and you ponder what's going on, how do you start trying to come up with some ideas about where we are, what our universe looks like, what our galaxy looks like, even before we get to what's going on within our universe? And so this was the first way then that he went ahead and tried to determine where we were, and that's simply by counting and plotting stars. So another several pictures of the Milky Way. This is probably one of my more favorite ones because I really, really, really like Utah. So this is taken out in Utah. You really have to have those dark skies and it really helps if you're up really high because you don't have a lot of that atmosphere to go through. And I also really, really, really like this picture because I've actually been there. And when I was there, it was late at night. I didn't quite get to see that Milky Way quite the way it's showing up here, but it was still pretty impressive. You can see the pictographs on then the right side. If you're into photography, guys, I would suggest that you might try taking one of those long exposure shots of the Milky Way to see what happens and see if you can get those kinds of pictures that literally bring out the arms within our galaxy. Okay, so like I said, you, what he did was try and plot everything. And then if we look, as I've stated earlier, if we look toward Sagittarius, then we know we're looking toward the center of our galaxy. And this is just kind of showing you the teapot in terms of Sagittarius and then looking through that, and you see then the heart of our galaxy right behind it. You're looking at then that galactic core. And one of the things I've got on Blackboard is looking at the same kind of picture, but then looking at all the things that you have, you know, in terms of 
open clusters, uh, looking at supernova remnants, looking at gas and dust clouds, nebulas out there that are in the direction of Sagittarius. Kind of give you a feel for what that area around there is like. So you've also got this or one like it on Blackboard to kind of get you oriented. And again, look at everything that you have in the sky when you're looking at Sagittarius. All the billions of stars that you have within our galaxy. I mean, it's almost, you know, if I said go count those, it's going to be extremely hard to count all the stars. And that's just within a very small area that you're looking at. Now, this is actually not a photograph. This is actually a drawing, trying to plot every place that you saw a star. And so you're looking then at the spiral, one of the spiral arms. But that's an impressive picture, guys, because it is a, a hand drawing and not an actual photograph. Notice the gas and dust that you see running through the spiral arms. Remember, that's where you're going to have lots and lots and lots of stellar evolution. So here you're getting some of those really new stars that are shining very well in infrared light. Again, all the gas and dust that's out there. Supernova remnants. You can kind of look at those red things, those red gas clouds, and kind of follow them back. You can almost see that at some point they were meeting in the far distant future, and that's where you had these big explosions that went off and formed our supernovas. Now, as we start getting toward the center of our Milky Way, And I'm going to stop with this, or at least stop for this picture for just a second. This is not taken in visible light. But what we find is we look toward the center of our Milky Way, it's extremely energetic. Lots and lots and lots of energy are there. Now, we can't actually look and see the center of our galaxy because, as I just showed you, there's lots of gas and dust there. So we have to have other ways of looking and using the entire electromagnetic spectrum to be able to see what's going on within the core of our galaxy. And when we do that, one of the ways that we can account for how energetic this core of our galaxy is, is by looking at these really old stars that have already gone off. And these stars were massive when they were formed. They went off. They were so massive that when they formed that supernova explosion, they weren't able to go ahead and the core going all the way down to a neutron star, the star when it rebound or when it rushed down and hit that core, simply caused that core to collapse and that core formed a black hole. Okay? And so we have lots of these really big, massive stars that were originally in the core that have gone through their evolutionary sequence. And so we have lots and lots of black holes in the center of our galaxy. We think this is something that's pretty common. And you do see a lot of galaxies out there with very active cores. And you have material then that is given off as these stars then are being cannibalized, the stars that are there now, being cannibalized by the black holes. And so that material, that star is being pulled in. And so as it's being pulled in, you get lots of energy given off. This is just looking at our galaxy and looking at the galactic or the spiral arms coming across. And you can see how intense those are in terms of the energy that they're putting out. Again, I've given you the URL for this one. So you're looking at that same kind of area. And you can see all the gas and dust. But the problem is that gas and dust then is not allowing us to see all the way toward the very, very center. And so I'm going to have you kind of check this one out. So what we want to do is we want to be able to look at the galactic core, not in visible light, but in something else other than visible, which is generally x-rays radio waves, things like that, that's going to give us a feel for what's going on within that core. And when we do that, and this is taken in x-rays, you get this incredibly energetic material. And we think, like I said, that's what's happening when you have black holes at the core of our galaxies, of our galaxy, and material then from other stars is being pulled into these black holes. 
and energy then is given off as that material spirals down into that black hole. These are all artificially colored, guys, because you're looking at the core of our galaxy in x-rays to really get a feel for what's going on there. Like I said, we think this is probably true of most of the galaxies out there. You know, a lot of them where you have those really old stars in there that have already evolved, gone through their evolutionary sequence, and those really big ones in the process of forming, excuse me, in forming that supernova when that rest of that star collapsed down on that core, that core just couldn't take it and collapsed basically down into nothing. So I'm going to stop with that picture right there, which is a picture of looking directly at the center of our galaxy and looking at that tremendous energy that is associated with the black holes there. So I want to stop with this one because what I want to do next time is I want to start in and go through that classification of those galaxies to see how well you did that. Then I want to go ahead and talk about spirals, how we form the spiral arms. Okay, what happens at the core of those galaxies when we've got those black holes? And we'll go back then and talk about both spirals and ellipticals and then start talking about these other galaxies that are out there when we start looking back further and further and further in time. Because realize, guys, that if our galaxy, or excuse me, our universe is 13.7 billion years ago, if I look at these galaxies that are literally billions of light years away, then I'm looking back in time. And so that gives me a feel then for what the early universe was like. So... With that, think about what happens at the center of our galaxy. Think about those black holes that are out there. Go make sure you're able to identify those galaxies. And with that, we'll start up next time. See you then. Bye.